figuring out how to take really good science-based and evidence-based concepts in mental health and make it so that these are applicable across you know, any community uh, that you, you might serve. So in that sense, this is just examples of what our team at the Child Mind Institute has done over the past uh, you know, one to two years. So in that sense, in, in thinking about how we can make our social emotional learning more uh, relevant and connecting to communities we serve, we focused on recruiting staff and clinicians uh, who speak the languages that are spoken within our communities, or who also are drawn from diverse backgrounds in the communities that we serve so that we have a more diverse team that reflects the diversity of the communities that we're working with. Um, we think that's an extremely important. And I mean, that's something that's been uh, obviously written about uh, extensively. Uh, we also focus on within team work. So what that means is that every other week, our team meets to review readings on uh, anti-racist themes uh, and also to review lectures or other resources from experts in this particular area in thinking about how we bring that back to ourselves as people and also thinking about how we bring that back to our work within the community. Uh, we've centered our professional development for our staff on extending our interventions and thinking about how to integrate racial stress and trauma as well as themes of equity and anti-racism. Uh, we've really focused, and, and these are what the last two bullet points are on, on this idea that even as many of us have mental health degrees or consider ourselves to have some degree of expertise in these areas, you know, the bottom line is without feedback from the communities we serve, these things may be wooden, they may be hollow, they may be clunky, they may not necessarily meet the needs of the people that we're trying to make sure we get uh, traction with in, in building, you know, social emotional learning. So in that sense, we've created community review committees uh, consisting of all adult stakeholders in the communities that we serve. And we, we seek feedback and compensate them for that feedback uh, in, in looking at our materials and making sure that they're relevant to community concerns and that they're reflective of the needs and perspectives of the communities that we serve. And then we've also prioritized you know, centering the voice of the youth that we serve in that we've recruited uh, about 30 uh, high schoolers drawn from a wide range of the schools and the communities that we serve. And we've said to them, we wanna hear your feedback on whether or not our view as adults of what is useful for you, what is helpful, is accurate. You know, we wanna hear how we can better reach uh, people in your age range and help them to feel that the resources we provide are meaningful and useful to them. And in that way, we've brought many of our things back to them in sort of uh, uh, humility and saying, look, we think that this is useful. Tell us, you know, kind of what you think about this. So, you know, look, just to, to kind of, you know, wrap up the, the through line that I'm trying to draw in this, this talk, it's that, you know, our team represents one iteration across the country of a group of clinicians and very motivated kind of nonprofit uh, uh, individuals who are working with schools across, you know, two major communities and then across, you know, uh, school districts across the country where we're trying to address, you know, uh, the, the kind of intersection of two things. The fact that within the science, we have uh, significant literature around what social emotional skills can break down stigma, increase mental health literacy, and help people to prevent maybe the later onset or severity of mental health and learning disorders. At the same time, that knowledge is useless without understanding how to make it relevant to the very populations that we are trying to make sure uh, feel like this is accessible and, and useful to them. So in that sense, some of our major lessons learned and some of the things that I hope you take from this presentation back to your own communities are that if you're trying to engage your, you know, kind of community in thinking about more social emotional learning, choosing skill building materials and resources is only the first step. Knowing what curriculum you want to use, knowing what skills you want to teach, that's, that's the, the first and most basic step. And the reality is, even if you choose a curriculum, and I want to be clear, and you teach that to a bunch of youth, you know, a number of the youth that you teach it to will benefit from that. It's not to say that it's, you know, not a useful effort if that's the only step that you can muster. But beyond that, the, the more we see communities engage in the steps that are kind of the cascade below it, the, the more likely we are to see real success with these types of models. In the sense that if we can do something within, uh, you know, parent, educator, and student communities, to think about community experiences, systemic barriers, uh, things that may have been uh, exacerbated by recent stressors, and really own the fact that there may be longstanding histories uh, of kind of you know, uh, mistrust of you know, mental health and health institutions, or acknowledge you know, how things like systemic racism 
uh, might be present, even in the way that we think through things like social emotional curricula. That also helps to make sure that you know, we're owning the, the way that we want to collaboratively approach these things. Um, you know, to the, the third bullet point here, it's that, you know, social emotional learning, if we really want it to be effective, isn't twice a week, you know, during a particular class period. It's that you might teach it, you know, during a once weekly or twice weekly session. But then the key thing that should be the focus at the end of any social emotional learning session is how are we going to collaboratively incorporate this into our daily routines and across settings? How are we going to make it so that this happens at home and at school and the kids feel authorized to take that space for it, particularly because it's going to be so important as we embark on the next school year and we look toward, you know, some of the kids that may have, you know, flown under the radar uh, during the pandemic that we may not have been able to uh, contact or at least be able to kind of be in contact with as much. Uh, you know, we want to focus with uh, social emotional approaches as well is our measurement of reach and impact. So we also want to know that when we apply these approaches, that they're having a desired impact. The reason why we, we track coping skills in the students we serve with social emotional learning is that we want to know that there's uptake of these skills, that the kids report that they're using them. Because if they're not, then we want to go back to the drawing board. And that's really where we want to be data driven. And finally, you know, it's a feedback loop. It's that whenever you choose a curriculum, and you try to acknowledge some of the forces that are at work within your community, and you try to figure out how you're gonna collaboratively incorporate it into daily routines, and you try to figure out how you're gonna know how you're effective, people have thoughts. And it's, it's good to get that kind of buy-in by giving people the opportunity to give feedback on those approaches and to continue to tweak them in ways that make them ever more relevant to your community and useful for your community. So in that sense, any creative way you can think to seek out feedback continually you know, that, that can only make these efforts stronger.